Hello, uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Spencer Ruckty. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington. Um, and in, on behalf of our bookstore and community bookstore in Brooklyn, I'm really pleased to welcome you to uh, tonight's event with Stephanie McCarter and Sherry Magid uh, for a conversation about Stephanie's new translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, first of all, I would like to invite all of you uh, watching to uh, use the chat window at the bottom of your screen and say hello. Just let us know where you're calling in from. Um, like I said, we're really excited to be hosting this conversation on our server, so to speak. Uh, this historic new edition of Ovid's Metamorphoses uh, comes with a wonderful introduction on reading Ovid today, uh, as well as a detailed translator's note. Um, McCarter addresses accuracy in translation and Ovid's representation of women, gender dynamics of power, and sexual violence in the Metamorphoses. Um, while you are chatting up, uh, third place books and community bookstore, uh, have a full calendar of events leading into the holiday season. Um, if your interest is translated literature, we have wonderful offerings for you as well. Uh, two specifically in the near future on Thursday, we're going to be hosting a virtual event um, with translator Maureen Freely and New York critic uh, Merve Emre uh, discussing Maureen's translation of Dawn by the legendary Turkish feminist uh, Sevgi Soyozol. Um, and on December 7th, we're teaming up again with Community Bookstore and the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith to bring you a virtual conversation with French translators Emma Robindon and Olivia Bays, and they'll be discussing a new translated novel uh, by Margaret Dura. So Third Place Books hosts around 200 events a year. Uh, I encourage you to visit thirdplacebooks.com slash events for our full calendar, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter. Um, as I mentioned, that chat window is open at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Uh, during the last 15 minutes or so, we'll also have time for your questions. So if you have questions for our uh, writers this evening, please submit those in the Q&A window below, which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Um, we also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. You can just hit the live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn that feature on or off. Uh, a reminder that this event will be recorded, so if you miss anything, we'll be emailing that recording to everyone who registered. And of course, you can order the Metamorphoses from your neighborhood independent bookstore. If you're in Seattle, stop by any one of our three locations in Lake Forest Park, Ravenna, or Seward Park. And if you're in New York, you should make a beeline for Community Bookstore. Uh, go say hi to their turtle for me. Um, I've never met him. I would love to in the near future. Um, every purchase you make supports the future of our author series, so thank you. And now without further ado, I am pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Stephanie McCarter is a professor of classical literature at the University of South um, in Sewanee, Tennessee. She has previously published two books on Latin poetry, including a translation of Horace's Apods, uh, Odes, and Carmen Seculara. Her writing has appeared in the Sewanee Review, Electric Literature, Literary Hub, and elsewhere. And Sherry Magid is a playwright and librettist. Uh, her film slash play, A Poem and a Mistake, was presented by Australian Centre for Contemporary Art in Melbourne in 2021 as part of their exhibit, uh, an autobiography of Daphne, uh, which was featured in the BBC Radio 4 podcast, Modern Metamorphoses, and it will be performed live at Delaware Rep in 2023. She also wrote the, uh, she also happened to write for the Emmy award-winning children's television show, Arthur, um, tonight, uh, these two will be discussing Stephanie's new translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, I was recently reading the critic uh, review by the critic and classicist Daniel Mendelssohn, uh, who wrote was writing for the New Yorker this week, in which he gives a deep context for Ovid's life and work and praises Stephanie's approach to the text. Uh, he writes that McCarter confronts the tricky issues associated with both the poet and his epic, not only in her forthright introduction, but in the translation itself where, like an art restorer, removing decades of brown varnish from an old master, she strips away a number of inaccuracies and embellishments that have accreted in translations over the decades and centuries, obscuring the sense of certain passages, particularly those portraying women in sexual violence. So we are so happy to have these two with us tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming Steffi McCarter and Sherry Magid, uh, Magid to your screen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Spencer. Welcome, everybody. Um, Stephanie, it's wonderful to see you. I figured out this is the seventh time we are talking <laughs> together. Um, we've we've talked for places uh, London, Melbourne, Swanee, 
and now Brooklyn and Seattle. So I'm so thrilled to continue our, our conversation. So uh, yeah. So the first thing that I'd I just love you to share with everyone is I, I love your origin story of how you started translating Ovid and Metamorphoses, because it seems to me that this is something that happened very organically. So maybe you could talk about that. Sure. Yeah. So I didn't train to be a translator. I don't have an MFA or um, uh, you know, training in poetry, but I was very determined to turn to the kind of writing that goes outside of the academy to the public at large. And so um, I just in my office one day in around 2016, decided to sit down and um, was reading or was to translate Horace. And um, this turned into a book proposal and into translation. Um, and I had more fun with it than anything I'd ever done. And at the same time, I started writing sort of public facing essays for different venues. And um, a lot of these essays took up how gender um, is presented in ancient authors. And um, and I wrote an essay on all of it in this one scene in particular um, on the rape of Leucothoe by um, the sun and uh, really looking at the way that um, other translators had rendered that as a scene of consensual, almost almost kind of titillating sex. And, um, and that really bothered me for a number of reasons, but mainly because I had taught my students from these different translations and it had confused them. And so I would often bring in the Latin and we would sort of look at it and I would explain what it meant and um, you know the, the technical vocabulary that Ovid was using. And uh, one of my students looked at me and she said, you, you really should write on this. And uh, so I wrote an art, I wrote an essay for Electric Lit about it. And um, you know, at the end of the essay, I said, you know, it's pretty much time for another woman to try to translate this epic. And at the time, I had no idea I would be that, <laughs> be that person. And, um, and, and I got an email from Penguin not, not long after that, and uh, it sort of all fell into place because I am quite, um, I like to, to translate into meter. And so I just, in my spare time, started translating different episodes. And so I had a couple of things ready to go when Elder Roeder, um, the wonderful, wonderful publisher of Penguin Classics got in touch. And uh, I think I sent them to her within an hour of her <laughs> getting in touch with me. Wow, that's so great. I I'm wondering, was there a particular moment that you just thought, I want to, I want to speak to the public as, at large, and I don't want to speak directly, uh, at, at, only to the academy. Was right. there a there was. It was when my daughter was one year old and my son was three. And I realized <laughs> that um, that my time was finite, uh, that I could devote to writing. And I just said, I don't want to write another word that I don't feel really compelled to write. Like, I don't want to write just for the sake of publishing an article in an academic journal. And then let me say that that decision is all um, was based on the luxury of having gotten tenure. So a lot of people who are working towards tenure um, don't have the opportunity to translate because very often it doesn't count towards tenure. Um, so this this turn towards translation came after tenure, which is a whole other conversation that we could have. Yeah. <laughs> but um, at any rate, so you know, I had this finite amount of time and just really thought, what do I want to do with my precious amount of time? And it became really important to me to think about the way classics um, intersects with the world at large. It's not something that we can sort of keep in an ivory tower. We shouldn't. Um, classics should engage with the world at every opportunity. Um, and in order for classicists to engage with the world, we need to write for the world, <laughs> right? And not just for each other. And, um, and translation is a way that you can really take these old texts and update them for a new moment, right? It's a process of transformation uh, to transform them so that they can speak to a new set of readers. And for all of it, I felt that was really important because so many of the translations um, had a lot of dated language, a lot of dated um, um, baggage when it came to the way women were presented, bodies were presented, sexuality was presented, sexual violence was presented. And to me, it was just a way to update the poem for a new set of readers. 
while also, um, you know, to me, giving it a kind of style that I thought Ovid demanded. Ovid should never sound dated and old fashioned, right? He, he needs to sound current and contemporary because in his own moment, his Latin is so current and contemporary. Um, if you compare it to other poets, it, it's, you know, he doesn't use archaisms. He's, he's really, he's really changing. It's new, it's innovative. And so I wanted it, I wanted all of his language to sound new and contemporary and engaged with who we are now. It's, it's interesting because I've been thinking a lot about Ars Amatoria and how it's been um, claimed by the pickup artist, which is an all right, very misogynist um, group that uh, considers that text, which was a, a text meant to needle Augustus, um, literally. And it seems to me that you're directly answering them with metamorphosis by taking it back out of other people that would not only translate it, you know, in a stuffy way, but in a dangerous way. So, right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to know, for me, Ovid takes a critical stance towards the violence that he describes. That violence takes lots of forms. The gods can be abusive in a number of ways. Um, and one of those ways is through rape. So most of the rapists in the Metamorphoses are gods. There are some exceptions, of course. You have Tarius, who's human and perpetrates a horrendous rape. Um, but you know, I think that Ovid is getting us, trying to get us to think about power critically and the way power transforms us. And rape isn't one way that power transforms people um, through the trauma of the body, the trauma of the mind. And so the um, really bringing that to the fore and seeing rape as something Ovid himself as being critical of was, was extremely important to me. Um, and, you know, I think Ovid, it's really um, tempting in some ways to align him with the different personas that he's writing in. So we really want to align Ovid with the pickup artist sometimes of the Ars Amatoria, but he's not that. I mean, this pickup artist is an inept guy. Nobody's going, he's, I don't think he would successfully pick anybody up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and so I do think that Ovid as a, as an author is able to stand at a critical distance from the poetry that he writes. Um, and so we always have to keep in mind that the space between Ovid and the text is one of the most interesting spaces to explore. Um, and so he is really able, I think, within that space to, to shine a critical light on the stories that he's inherited the violent, and the violence within his own world, within this sort of mythological poem. So I wanted to back up for one second and just talk about the poem in general, because I don't know maybe if you've encountered this, but as an artist that works with metamorphosis, a lot of times people, people are apologetic because they're like, oh man, I should, I kind of know what it is. I, 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 I know I should have, maybe I read part of it in college. So um, it's a, it's a kind of weirdo epic in many ways. And I just thought perhaps you could talk a little bit about why it's strange and how it's strange. Well, I could talk about that for the rest of the talk, but I'll try to limit myself to a couple of things. Um, well, first of all, you know, epic was a pretty, um, in terms, pretty standard genre in the ancient world. And one thing the Romans were interested in, though, is exploring the boundaries of that genre. So Lucretius writes a philosophical epic, but for the most part, epics revolved around a hero, a central conflict, and a particular goal, right? So Odysseus coming home from the Trojan War, the goal is Penelope and getting back home. There is none of that really here. The only goal that seems to exist is to bring time to the present. Um, so it starts at the beginning and it comes to Ovid's own Rome. Um, and there's no central hero. Um, there is no central sort of God running the show. So it's really unusual in that regard. But to me, some of the other really interesting ways, it's an unusual epic. And this is one reason I love it. Um, you know, traditional epic, it brings us into the interior emotional lives of heroes, right? Um, so Aeneas and his famous piety and how conflicted he is about his mission. He doesn't really want to be doing it, but he does it. Um, you know, the wrath of Achilles um, and how it sort of dehumanizes him. There's no male hero in the metamorphoses that gets that kind of treatment. And all of it is more interested in at applying that same 
uh, depth to women characters. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we get the psychological complexity of Achilles in the Iliad, but here he's kind of flat. And Ovid is much more interested in exploring, um, you know, the women who suffer from the Trojan War, um, the women who suffer the violence of rape, getting into their interior lives, and also making them really complex moral agents. So you have women like Medea who are capable of great, you know, great evil, um, and just as Achilles is capable of great evil. And so to me, that's one thing that's so interesting about, about reading this is that it's a, it's an ancient author who's really interested in giving women characters complexity, humanity, and depth. Great. Um, I also like just in the tales that you've mentioned, the thing is that uh, people may not know metamorphoses, but they know metamorphoses yeah. because we know the tales. And yeah. can you talk a little bit about, like, to me, it feels like metamorphoses is in our collective, mm -hmm. it's in the water. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would love to ask my students. I'm teaching an Ovid class right now. Um, and I love to ask my students, do you know the story? And they always say yes. And I say, well, how do you know the story? And they can never tell me where they learned the story. And I think maybe I learned it here. So it is really very much a part of our you know, collective culture in a lot of ways. I think one reason is that people are still engaging with this story on so many levels. Your own work, right? Um, your own, you know, your uh, the poem in a mistake um, is engaging with this story. Um, and we, I'm, I'm sitting here next to Madeline Miller's Galatea, <laughs> which is rewriting this story. So we're still using this story to, to think with. If our students, if readers have been to an art museum, they probably have seen stories from Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, so it's very much still a part of who we are and how we think about our, our society. What I like to do though, is get my students to think about some of the stories they perhaps don't know. Um, so, um, you know, some of the stories, say, later in the epic, like Iphis and Ionthe, um, you know, that's not really a story that's often um, presented in art, for example. Um, and so that's one I really like to get students uh, to read because it's a new encounter and not just an encounter with a story that they've encountered so many times previously. Well, I know that um, on the on the other hand, <laughs> you wanted to read a passage that many of us might be familiar with yeah. the story, although you are translating it different from some of your predecessors. Sure. So, yeah. Speaking of Madeline Miller's Galatea, I thought this would be a good opportunity, perhaps, to to, uh, to read the Pygmalion story because it's it's pretty short. Um, but this is uh, following the story of the Propoitides, who were the first prostitutes, and um, and also sort of figures of impiety. And Pygmalion disapproves of these women and doesn't really think that women are that impressive in general. So he creates his own perfect woman, who is an ivory statue. So I will I will read this. Um, Pygmalion watched them pass their lives in crime, and outraged by the myriad faults that nature gave women's minds. He long lived on his own without a wife and shared his bed with no one. Meanwhile, with his astounding art, he sculpted a statue from uh, excuse me, he sculpted a statue from white ivory and gave it beauty with which no woman can be born. He fell in love with his own masterpiece. She looks like a real virgin, alive, you'd think, and wishing to be roused, if not so modest. So much does art hide art. Pygmalion marvels as his heart drinks in flames from man-made flesh. He often strokes his masterpiece to test whether she's flesh or that same ivory and won't admit she still is ivory. He kisses her and thinks she kisses back. He speaks to her and holds her and believes his fingers sink into the arms he's touched and fears that he will bruise her if he presses. Now he tries sweet talk. Now he brings her gifts pleasing to girls fresh pearls and polished stones, small birds and flowers and in a thousand hues, lilies, bright balls, and the Heliades tree fallen tears. He decks her limbs in clothes, puts jewels on her fingers and long pendants around her neck. Smooth beads hang from her ears and ribbons drape her chest. Everything suits her. And nude, she's no less beautiful to look at. He lays her, he lays her down on blankets dyed with purple calls her his bedmate and reclines her head against soft pillows as if she can feel them. Venus's festival had come and Cyprus was thronged with celebrations. 
Gilt-horned heifers had fallen dead, struck on their snow-white necks, and incense smoked. His offering complete, Pygmalion stood beside the altar, praying nervously, If, gods, you can grant all things, that my wife be, he did not dare to say, my ivory virgin, like my ivory virgin. And golden Venus, present for her rites, discerned his prayer. To signal her goodwill, the flame shot up three times into the sky. Back home, he seeks the statue of his girlfriend and lays her on the bed to give her kisses, and she seems warm. He kisses her again, and with his hands, he also feels her chest. The ivory grows soft, its hardness gone, and sinks beneath his fingers' touch, like wax from Mount Hymettus softened by the sun. A thumb can bend and mold it into many shapes as it grows more usable with use. Amazed, the lover cautiously rejoices, scared to be wrong. Time and again, his hand caresses what he prayed for. She is flesh. His thumb can feel her pulse. The Paphian hero conceives abundant words of thanks to Venus. He kissed real lips at last. Feeling his kiss, the virgin blushed. Raising scared eyes to heaven, she saw her lover in the sky at once. <laughs> so um, that's, it's amazing. It's so vivid and visceral. Um, uh, so, so using this as a case study, what are sure. some of the things that are different from some of the translations that you were familiar with? Sure. So I really wanted to um, think about the statue's acquisition of identity. And one of the ways I did that was through rethinking her body. Um, I was really attuned to the way, especially women's bodies, were uh, described by translators. And one word that appears a couple different times is the word pectus. Look at the word pectoral from this, like pectoral muscles, <laughs> right? And so this is a chest. And in, um, in Ovid, the chest is a seat for one's identity. It is for, for Roman thought in general. This is where your emotions reside, right here in your chest. It's where your in intellect is. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it's where we point when we say I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a real sight of identity. And so when Pygmalion um, touches her chest, and that's the moment of animation, it was really important to me that he, he touched her chest. And what the word that Ovid uses again is pectus. But no other translators have him do that. They have him massage her breasts. And <laughs> um, I can't think of another translator off the top of my head that says clearly chest. There may be one that, um, that's there. And, and so, you know, going through, I started noting that every time her chest appears, it's breasts. And so when he's dressing her up and she's got these sort of ribbons draping down her chest, this gets translated as a, you know, a lacy brassiere in one instance. And so it's really um, upping the sex factor, right? And so we see her in this really sexualized way as though we're looking at her through Pygmalion's eyes only. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think Ovid's Latin actually opens up a way for us to think about her own experience of coming to life. And so it's not just about Pygmalion's experiences, it's also about hers. And so it was really important to me not to succumb to that same kind of sexualization of her body and only present her through the male gaze. That is fascinating. Also, it's just hilarious. The idea of like, what will turn the statue to life is massaging <laughs> her breast. Like that yeah. is just, I mean, it's so funny because you've talked a lot about um, word choice in, in in some of these and and the euphemisms or um, misnamings of rape, uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that and and what we were talking about right before the talk started. Sure. Because I mean, I'm sorry, massaging your breast to to give <laughs> consciousness is the funniest thing I've heard in a long time. And disturbing, <laughs> also. Yeah. a little bit disturbing, but it is a little disturbing. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a disturbing story. It doesn't need the extra layer of being disturbing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, I, I also, I love that that particular story has birthed so many other yeah. stories. I, mean, I, I have a, um, a play about a mannequin brought to life. So, you yes. know, it's, it's like it lives on and on. But anyway, going back to sure. wrong word choices and, and how it leads us to certain right. conclusions. Right. You know, again, I think there's a desire 
to make Ovid a little sexy, right? Like he, that's how we have associate, that's a word we have associated with Ovid. It's maybe the Ars Amatoria plays into this. He's the, you know, he's the manual for pickup artists. And so he, he's fascinated by sex and interested in being sexy. And even Quintilian in the Roman world referred to him as lascivious, so like lascivious. Yeah. And to some degree, I think that that view colors the way we read some of his scenes, even the scenes of sexual violence. So for example, a word that's very, very commonly used to translate um, scenes of rape is ravish, right? Um, and I think, you know, there's a couple of reasons why this word is often used. And one is that it's maybe perhaps uncomfortable to say rape. <laughs> um, and so translators have often kind of stood at a distance from that word. On the other hand, ravish has come to have almost a really consensual connotation in English. Um, and I, so before, uh, before we started recording, I was talking about how I often show my students the, the covers of romance novels. And so you'll get romance novels like To Rescue or Ravish or Ravish Me Completely. And those suggest like, you know, and I think the OED uses the word ecstatic delight to, to define ravishment. And um, so again, it's just, it's thinking um, about Ovid in a new way, not just as the sort of naughty, sexy poet um, that he's often thought of being, but as as a person who's really critical <laughs> of power. And so to me, I just really wanted to reorient the epic around the theme of power um, rather than view Ovid simply as kind of an irreverent, funny guy. To me, it was there's a lot of that there. And I tried to show that in the in the epic. But to me, even the irreverence um, is is tied up with the overall focus on power and how it works. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of defiance in Ovid that sometimes comes out as a reverence. I mean, he's a very complex writer. Yeah. And um, to me, he's really, and I think that you, we've talked about this, he really wants to take a kaleidoscopic view mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on humanity. And yeah. so he's, he's, he's all of those things and yeah. none of those things, you know? <laughs> right, um, right. Oh, well, and, you know, even, I think, so many of these stories you can read, you know, in, in a couple different ways that he doesn't give you a simple answer. And I kind of got, um, I was delighted because one word that I've used to describe all of it a lot is slippery. And I was reading the afterward. I can't keep, I'm like plugging Madeline Miller's Galatea again and again. <laughs> I, I taught it um, a few years ago and I taught really well, but um, she uses, uses the same word slippery, right? You can never quite get, get your grasp on Ovid, right? Because he's going to slip through your fingers. Um, you, you'll think you have figured out how to read him. And then suddenly you'll realize that there's a whole other way to read him. Um, and so it's almost like every, everything in the epic has sort of two sides. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I often think of how humanity is presented in the epic. You know, and to one degree, we are defiant against gods who are real jerks very often who use their power in abusive ways but on the other hand you could say well maybe sometimes humans are impious right depending on how you configure the relationship with the gods and so um you know Abba doesn't present a simple straightforward version of that story both things are sort of simultaneously true within within the epic which is what makes him so wonderful to think with um and to rewrite <laughs> as you know yeah, and to translate because you're trying to capture all of that sure. at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about, I know you're going to be excited about this, about iambic pentameter and your <laughs> choice to translate the poem into that. Well, I, um, this is me just really loving so many of my predecessors in translation who've returned to form. Um, you know, I, 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 adore Emily Wilson's Odyssey, and I think she gave iambic pentameter uh, really, she, she helped really popularize the, the meter in terms of classics and mm -hmm. translating the classics. But, but, you know, prior to that, you know, you have A.M. Juster, A.M. Puchigian, A.E. Stallings, you have all of these wonderful translators who've returned to form, which for a long time wasn't a standard way to translate the classics. You get, you know, a lot of free verse, um, and to me, it was great because not only do I just love iambic pentameter and I love writing in it, but I have also um, 
had to use it as a kind of uh, helpful tool for myself because, you know, I'm a classicist. I was trained to translate in a very stilted kind of way, as a lot of classicists are. Um, so, you know, we love sentences that read like, with the town having been burned, <laughs> the citizens were running to the sea. <laughs> and um, iambic pentameter became a way for me to just get myself out of that. Mm -hmm. And it, it compelled me to actually try to, um, to, to use style that spoke to a contemporary audience and not just, and didn't just seek to, just to demonstrate that I understood the Latin. Um, it, do, I don't know if you know this term, but I find it really helpful. It's an enabling constraint. Yes, to, exactly. Yeah, it's it's really interesting when you, um, as a writer, when you have a form that's limiting, how that at the same time weirdly opens things up. I, yeah. I don't know why. I think it. someone explained it to me, a composer I was working with, where it was like it eliminates certain possibilities and, and allows you to concentrate on, on fewer of them. And uh, I don't know, it's also like a puzzle, like a, a composing yeah. a puzzle in a way. It um, certainly is, yeah. I'm writing down enabling constraints. I know, I, you know, <laughs> it is so funny because when, when this composer said it to me, I'm like, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, I wanted to write it down. Um, well, can you talk, uh, uh, also, I, I'm like coming up with like your next project is the romance version of Ovid's <laughs> Metamorphosis and then also the literal translation because right. I've seen the two comic side pieces to your <laughs> translation. But um, can you can you talk a little bit more about like the literal translation versus the literary translation? Sure, you know, I think that, well, I can say that classicists traditionally have been drawn to doing the literal translations. I mean, one of the chief um, examples of this is The Lobe, which is, um, a, you know, it's a series of books published by Harvard University Press um, that seeks to just have, give you a very literal translation. It has Latin or Greek on one side and then English on the other. And the idea is you can kind of follow along and see where you are. Um, and so that has been a almost accepted scholarly activity, whereas creative literary translation hasn't been something that classicists have really practiced very often. But I do think that there um, that's changing. Um, I think that more often, I hope now, translation counts towards tenure and promotion, whereas it hasn't always. I like the idea of scholar translators, like scholars who are doing creative translation, because, you know, too often we've had this sort of, um, you know, the really hyper literal translation on the one hand, that's very accurate, but doesn't necessarily capture the beauty of what we're reading. Um, and on the other hand, the really beautiful poetic translations, but, you know, um, often fail to reflect certain aspects of the Latin and, or the Greek. And so to me, I was really trying to do both of these things and to use, you know, 20 years of studying Ovid <laughs> um, and, you know, many, as many years of teaching Ovid, letting that inform my translation, but, but putting it in a format that I hoped was appealing with iambic pentameter and which was also just personally satisfying to me because um, I love writing an iambic pentameter and love writing poetry and studied English um, literature when I was an undergraduate and felt like I had had to give all that up. And so this was a way for me to reclaim a, a sort of creative mode of writing. That's that's so cool. Um, just side note, Milica was trying to get me to write in dactyl hexameter for the libretto. Yeah. I was like, I don't get it. She tried to <laughs> it so many times and she, then she, she's like, forget it. It's fine. Um, you it's know, just, I, yeah as natural, you no. know, as the iambic pentameter, so. No. But once you get into it, it's kind of, I love it. Um, you know, I love Evangeline, uh, which is um, um, by Longfellow and it's wonderful dactylic hexameter. Cool. Yeah, um, once you get into it, it kind of works, but yeah, it, I, it's not natural to, it's to English. Natural. I, I just yeah. needed more time, but I was like too complicated to do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. All the um, great lines in English are in iambic pentameter. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, well, you're sort of um, hinting at one of my next questions, which is just like your where you see the relationship between um, translation and adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, having known you for a while, that 
um, people that whose work you get very excited about are doing these these adaptations of of the text, like Elizabeth Colomb and um, mm -hmm. and a few other people. So. Yeah. Just talk about that, the relationship, and then the relationship that you have with some of these writers and, and sure. artists. Sure, absolutely. I mean, some of my favorite people um, who, will, who are opening up new ways of reading Ovid are people who are doing adaptation. Um, so Elizabeth Columba, her painting, um, she's sort of re- um, you know, rethinking Ovidian myth in really interesting ways. Um, Nina McLaughlin, her book Wake Siren, Paisley Rickdahl, Nightingale. And there are all these wonderful, um, you know, uh, people who are adapting Ovidian myth. And they have a really interesting relationship with translation. I mean, translation is a kind of um, reception as well. It's an artistic reception, but it has an, um, you know, it sort of sits in the middle between Ovid's Latin and these other artists who are taking up these stories. So one of my favorite moments was reading Allie Smith's Boy Meets Girl and realizing that she had been reading the Mary Ennis translation of Ovid mm -hmm. and, and she was quoting it. And then I found out that she, you know, um, be on uh, Desert Island Discs, which is a BBC radio program, mm -hmm. that she said that Mary Ennis's translation would go with her to a desert island if you wow. know, she had to choose a book. And so then I looked at Nina McLaughlin's uh, acknowledgments and she acknowledged Alan Mandelbaum's translation. Yeah. I talked to you, you and I spoke about which translations you should yep. be reading. Yep. And um, so, so many of the people who are doing the most interesting adaptations of Ovid are actually relying on translators, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so I think that translation sits at a really interesting midpoint mm -hmm. between um, you know, between Ovid and adaptation in a way that I think hasn't really been fully explored enough. Um, and yeah. so one thing, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, you, go ahead, you. Well, I mean, to me, the most exciting prospect is that someone might be, you know, think of my translation as a source for, um, for informing their own ad adaptation. That would be, that would be like the uber goal of everything. I think that would be wonderful. I think that that's absolutely going to happen. Um, no, no question. But, um, you know, to your point of like you told, so you told um, Sarah and I to read the Mandelbaum and the Humphreys. Mm -hmm. And I've told you this story before. We sat across each other, from each other at a residency and I was zipping along in the Humphreys and she's like, why, why, yeah. how did you go that fast? Because she was reading the Mandelbaum and it's like, what, 3,000 lines yeah. or something crazy longer? Yeah, it was and, like 7,000 lines longer than mine, something like that, yeah. It's, it's, it, we were like, what, what, you know, there were various things that were, I can't even remember, but there were references and we're like, but that's not even in the Humphreys, you know, right. like it's, it's the similes and the metaphors would go on forever. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting because, you know, having, knowing you while we, while I was writing that piece, I was also thinking of like being at Swanee spoken word and hearing right. you do some of, some of, uh, right. you know, reading from the text. So right, right. it's already, it's already starting. <laughs> um, and that also goes along with um, one thing that I thought was really interesting in your introduction was that um, this recurring theme in metamorphosis of those who are silenced are not silenced because right. they have art. Right. Can you speak exactly. about that? Yes. So um, I can speak about that, especially in relation to the cover. <laughs> um, so I was, I, I am so interested in Ovid's really uh, sensitive um, exploration of what voice means and what, um, speaking means because you know so often these characters are silenced through metamorphosis or silenced through rape silenced through some kind of trauma and they um very often not always but very often are able to reclaim their voice in some way or to use the metamorphosis as a continuing way to speak to their own emotions so you know a woman uh, might turn into a stream out of grief well the stream is forever speaking to her inner life right so um, but one way this often happens is through art. And so you have Philomela, who's raped by Tereus, and he cuts out her tongue. And she's able to, um, to speak through, through weaving um, a tapestry in red and white. <laughs> so to me, it was really nice that the tapestry um, on the front has red, uh, kind of red and white colors. Um, and her sister is able to read this. And um, 
Ayo, she's able to use her hoof to write um, her name in the sand. So it's like the written word in that moment. So through the written word or through you know, artistic depictions, these characters are often able to reclaim their voice. And, um, and another interesting thing about this for me was that women often will do this through kind of secret language in the metamorphoses. Um, so when you don't have a voice, you have to communicate through art or through kind of coded speech. So Ovid, the word Ovid uses is signa. Um, so Philomela, she sort of weaves signs into the tapestry that her sister knows how to read. Um, Callisto blushes and it's a it's a sign to the other nymphs that she's been uh, that she's been raped. Um, uh, Ceres is searching for her daughter and, and Cyane shows her the girdle and that's a sort of sign. And so these women kind of can communicate with one another by using signs and experience that it's this sort of space that only women know how to read in other women. And that to me is a really interesting um, kind of way that Ovid uh, thinks about um, expression and and art. Um, you, you, it's, a, it's a way that oppressed people can speak to one another, right? Um, in ways that will speak to other oppressed people, but that the privileged might not be able to see. And that's one reason I think it's so important that many, many people of all kinds, you know, all kinds of people um, will translate these stories because they're going to be able to see the signs that other people before them would not have seen. And I hope I've seen some of those, but I want other people to read and translate this epic too and show new things to me also. Great, Spencer's back. <laughs> Hello, hey, I've returned. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Stephanie and Sherry for this wonderful conversation. Um, I've been having a great time watching from behind the scenes. Um, we are now at the audience Q&A portion of our evening. Um, we have a couple questions from uh, all of you rolling in. Please do keep submitting those questions. Uh, we have about 15 minutes um, for more answers. Um, let's see, let's start here with, uh, Best Myers has a really great question. She asks, um, teaching comes across as an important uh, part of your scholar uh, translator identity and your process of translating Ovid. Uh, I wonder whether you could speak more to teaching and how it's influenced uh, how you think about translation. And since it seems like you're also, you're, you're also thinking about translating and your translation in particular as a kind of teaching. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I ever would have turned to translation if it weren't for teaching. Um, I have the good fortune of teaching at a liberal arts college. And um, so many of the courses that I teach, I teach the translated text and I'm teaching mm -hmm. interdisciplinarily. Um, so I'm teaching to students who aren't classic students. And to me, um, I'm always aware that their encounter with Ovid or with whatever I'm teaching them um, will be in translation. And, um, and so part of why I turned to translation to begin with was simply because I wanted to use it in the classroom. That's the reason I sat down to translate Horace. Um, you know, I wasn't thinking um, ever that I would, you know, get a review in the New Yorker <laughs> or anything like that. It was <laughs> simply something I wanted to give to my students so that they would have, to me, a, an encounter I was trying to give them with, with the text. Um, and if I ever lose sight of how translation might be used in the classroom, I actually don't think I'll be as good a translator <laughs> because it's, it's oh, fascinating yeah yeah it's sort of at the core of my identity is being a teacher and um and I can't I can't divorce those two things so. yeah and part of right and I, I I guess working with young people fairly often um you know especially in undergraduate classrooms making yeah. these texts accessible to them and making them Absolutely. uh yeah, it was, is deeply important. That's that's a, that's a really great way to put it. Um, Elizabeth asks, uh, what challenges did you face during the translation process and how did you overcome them? Um, was there a, a story that was particularly difficult to translate or a character that you struggled to represent? Well, I mean, the Philomela and Procne and Terius story is always really tricky. And I think um, not just because the you know the horrible rape and glossectomy that happens to Philomela with her you know, tongue being vividly described as it is being cut out. There's also the, the murder of Itis, the, the, the young boy. And so I think that with that, I was really aware of what I was asking of the reader because I was going to demand that they make these connections 
that Ovid made. So I tried when uh, Ovid repeated vocabulary, I tried to repeat that vocabulary. I wanted mm -hmm. to compel them to think back to the rape when she's killing Itis because Ovid compels us to. And so I know what Ovid demands of the reader in that moment. I knew what I was going to demand of the reader. And that felt, I don't know how that felt. That felt um, like a complicated, complicated thing that I was asking the reader to do. Um, but, you know, I, I think that so many of the challenging things were, you know, um, unexpected. So it was just about, you know, encountering a weird sentence that had a strange, you know, prepositional phrase. And how was I going to get that into the meter? And so this is a kind of a moment where the techno technical aspects actually kind of um, counterbalance the, the emotional um, difficulties of encountering the, the themes. Um, so the sort of thinking about it in, in a technical level helped me sort of get past the, re you know, thinking about the horror that I was actually translating. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know every translator kind of has their different um, philosophy when it comes to this. But did you ever find yourself referencing other translate like for for very technical things like meter um, referencing other translations? Not for the meter. And I was I was kind of wary to actually look at poetic translations because yeah. I didn't want to get their their stuff in my head. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I was really scared of that, actually, because once you get that word in there, it's very hard to to remove it. Um, but, the, you know, one thing I might have looked at was like the lobe um, from time mm -hmm. to time. But um, that's very dated. And so I actually felt a little bit more comfortable if I, if I was facing yeah. like a difficult moment. Commentaries. I mean, that's the main thing. Yeah. There are lots of good commentaries for Ovid. Um, you know, I don't have the luxury of reaching out to Ovid on, you know, via email to ask, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to ask him. One of my favorite stories, um, Kevin Wilson, who is the novelist, his office is just a few doors down from mine. And he was telling me that one of his translators got in touch to ask him about the specific kind of mud um, he had in mind. Um, <laughs> and I can't like, do yeah, that. Yeah, that's the beauty of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. To a degree, I'm glad because um, I am kind of feel um, a freedom in translating Ovid that I might not have if it were a living author. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I got off off the exact trajectory of what you asked me, but. Uh... No, that's perfect. Um, we, we have a question from Will who asks, uh, what does it say about Ovid that Ovid is noticing things uh, or those hidden signs between marginalized people. I think this is in reference to a few questions back, but uh, did you, uh, did translating give you a different sense of the people behind the words? Yeah, I mean, so what that tells me is that Ovid um, wasn't blinded to these things because he is an elite Roman man. Like he actually found mm -hmm. women and the disempowered interesting and worthy of art and consideration, right? Um, and I, I think that in and of itself is really interesting, um, says we should read the Metamorphoses. <laughs> um, but I do think that Ovid is also writing in a particular time where a lot of Roman men were thinking that their own freedom had been limited by having an emperor. And so um, they're using other disempowered figures often to explore their own feeling of disempowerment under a sort of almost not a tyrannical figure, but certainly an authoritarian <laughs> kind of figure. Um, and so, you know, I think that Ovid, for example, is thinking a lot about what freedom means. It means having bodily autonomy. Well, who doesn't have bodily autonomy in his society? It's women, it's the enslaved, right? So he's he's exploring this issue through these characters and um, and with with a lot of profound insight about what that means. But I do, I would tie it back to his identity as a Roman. I would like to think that Ovid is just capable of in, immense um, empathy, but I also think some of it is about him thinking about his own status as a Roman. Excellent. Um, and so that's all the questions. Those are all the questions from the audience that we have. Um, but I did have one last question just about, uh, Stephanie, the creation of this book, specifically uh, the introduction and the translator's note that you include at the beginning of the book. Um, and most of all, I, I love translator's notes. I think it's a total art. It's like some translator's notes are 
two sentences and they're just remarking on something on like page 294. Uh, by the way, I use this word instead of this word because of this. And that's the, that's the end of it. Um, but you contribute, you know, a significant translator's notes kind of a la like Emily Wilson's, uh, you know, introduction and annotation of uh, her translation of the Odyssey. Um, and I was just curious what, I mean, what goes into the production of that small piece within the text? Like, what are you, you know, how do you decide what goes into that? I mean, you could, you could comment on the entire text as a whole. I mean, you could have annotation upon annotation upon it, but, but, you know, you have to distill that somehow. Right. Well, I think it was really thinking, what were my goals in this translation? And luckily I laid out sort of very specific goals for myself in the translation. I wanted to, to provide an updated translation that speaks to our current moment. It's metrically regular and has a formal quality to it that mirrors all of its own formal quality. And then I knew there were specific goals I had with the presentation of women and gender in the body. And so it was really a matter of just outlining those particular goals. And um, so I would encourage any translator to list what their goals are beforehand. Those are going to change as you're translating. But um, I think, you know, if you have thought through what your objective obje objectives actually are, why you're translating this text to begin with, the, the translating, the translator's note wrote itself is kind mm -hmm. of what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, and luckily I have to give a shout out to the people here at Sawani who, um, who have listened to me uh, talk about this for a long time, who let me write about this. So Adam Ross at the Sawani Review encouraged me to uh, write an essay for, the, for them um, on the way the body is translated. And having had that opportunity was priceless because it helped me think through a lot of these things beforehand. Um, writing for the Electric Lit um, mm -hmm. website. Um, so actually writing out things about translation beforehand, writing about translation was really important to, to articulating those goals as well. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, do either of you have any last remarks before we head out for the evening? Buy the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. This is a real treat. <laughs> It was yeah, absolutely. Uh, our pleasure. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Community book Bookstore, specifically Noah Mentz, their author events manager there. Um, you know, this Community Bookstore is a, a stalwart act advocate for literature and translation. Um, and uh, we really appreciate uh, working with them uh, as frequently as we do. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out this evening and have a wonderful night. Be well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.